It's useful up to year six. The aim isn't to make a reliance culture. The aim would be to wean children off Boxing Clever as soon as possible. Now before I go into your pack, one thing I need to say. Whether you like my idea or not is irrelevant to me, but if you want to raise standards, the one thing which I'd ensure isn't occurring in schools is the use of beginning, middle, end as a mechanism to structure stories. The, more, the younger the children are, the more useless beginning, middle, end is. Why? It's not debatable. The word beginning gives children no clues how to begin a story. The word middle doesn't give them a single clue how to control the middle. The word end doesn't show them how to end it. You might as well call it one, two, three, or A, B, C. So if I was auditing your school and I was looking at your planning, I'd make sure beginning, middle, end didn't exist. Just like I'd ensure that words like introduction and conclusion weren't used throughout the school. They also are useless. I choose my words very carefully because the introduction to a persuasive text is totally different to the introduction to a recount, which is totally different to the introduction of an explanation of a process. So I'd get rid of redundant language. So when I came up with this idea, it's over 20 years now. It's been on the board a long time. And in 16 years, I've been teaching it in the way I'm about to demonstrate. And I still teach it at least once a fortnight with a class I've never met before. Boxing Clever, slide one in your pack, the idea behind it. I'll chat you through it, make notes, then I'm going to do it as I teach it. Then I'll shut up for five minutes. That's a rare occasion, make the most of those five minutes. Then I'll take questions, observations and or worries. And let's get this over with quickly. If there's a worry, I don't view it as attack. If there's something you're not sure about or you don't like, ask the question, don't sit stone. And the only foolish question is the one not asked. Boxing clever. I wanted something which moved us beyond, beyond beginning, middle, end. Beginning, middle, end, waste of time. Now, when I first came up with the idea, I was teaching full time in a special school with children who had been excluded from mainstream, EBD it was at the time, children with extreme behavioural difficulties. And I'll be frank, if I was doing sport outside, I had no problems whatsoever. The kids had run around for ages. Uh, and there would be no issue sitting down on a carpet for 15 minutes in light of their previous IEPs wasn't just high expectation, it was unreasonable. So pragmatically, I thought, well, if I get them physically making a story, I'll hold their attention for longer. I've used it in mainstream in the way I'm going to show you for 16 years, and it has exactly the same effect. Memory is associative. And the more associative hooks I create for something, the more likely they are to remember it. So how does it work? Children are physically pulling pictures out of the bags. And it's why in this instance, the low-tech version is significantly better than a high-tech version. It's the physical act of pulling the pictures out of the bags and making a visual storyboard, as you'll see in a minute, that makes it important. It avoids a blank sheet of paper and it encourages the kids to play it making a story. Now, again, so no one goes for my jugular, because it's a temptation, uh, and hopefully I'll save you the bother. I'd be a fool if I thought I could reduce story writing to a formula. There are many, many ways to structure stories, but I'll tell you what I do think if I assume a child's frame of reference. You can't break a rule till you know what a rule is, and you don't become a risk taker till you're confident. And until kids understand the rules of the simplest story form, Victorian linear narrative, for those who are interested, they won't move to flashbacks, flash forwards, rational effects, all of the complex structural models coming up later this morning. So, use it with kids who can't hold a story together. Do not go near it with a group of children who can already retain story structure. How to make it and how to play it, slide two in your bag. Um, very, very quickly, it costs nothing. If I was attempting to sell you a resource, I'd be wary. Do you know what this will cost you? 45 minutes sitting down as a team making it. And what one person does is they produce the labels for the bags, and the bags go into each class as necessary. And then we collect Sunday supplements for about two, three weeks before that meeting, and this will all make more sense in about two minutes. 
And a couple of staff are cutting out the pictures for the who bags, another couple are cutting out the pictures for the where bags. And could you make a note? You can have as many pictures in each of these bags as you want, as long as you follow the headings that I'm about to take you through. Now, how to play it? I'm going to be showing you that and doing it as I teach it in around about five minutes. So let's cut to the chase, turn to the next page, page three in your pack. And what I've done to save us time, because there's so much we need to get through today. To save us time, I've given you the labels in your pack that would go on each of the bags. And it's that that I'm replacing beginning, middle, end with. Who, where, where next, why, what goes wrong, who helps, where last feelings. All of those words, bar one, deliberately taken from the high frequency word list. There's a difference between simple and simplistic. I'm deliberately using the simplest language possible. If I add complex terminology, it clogs up mental working space, remembering the language, and less children achieve the end aim, which is to write an effective Victorian linear story. Now, I'm going to take you through the pictures that go in each bag. The third column. If you can make notes as we go along, then I'll model it. Um, in the who bag or box, people only, and as many as you want. So, one school in Leeds burnt into my memory. It's not in my book, but it was a really clever idea that I wish I'd thought of, uh, but I appropriated it once I'd seen it. What the teacher did, and it was a behaviourally challenging year two class, is they got a digital camera, photographed all the pupils in the class, and placed their pupils' pictures in there. So when the kids pulled out a picture, one of them became the hero or heroine of the story. Really clever idea from an empathic response point of view. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a young lad who's um, lacking motivation, and we um, snuck a picture of his dad in. So as well, that, that helps. Oh, really great. Uh, anything like that at all? I think also. Um, and a clever idea, sticking a picture of a family member in so that there's a personalised element. What I'd also do is put objects in it as well. You know, it makes it tangible for younger kids. And later when I show you how I'd link this to history, putting objects in there that are historically appropriate to the time frame. You know, even if you're in a World War II boxing clever, to do something like um, a, a replica of um, a, a passport, for example, from the time, or a replica of a, a food coupon would be useful in it. Um, but yeah, bang on, perfect. Box two, or bag two, places they could live. And by that I mean individual buildings. A block of flats, a terrace house, a bungalow. And if it was me and you've collected Sunday supplements and colour magazines as suggested, you know, they're packed full of Barrett Holmes adverts, Wimpy Holmes adverts, Shepherd Holmes adverts. One member of staff searches in Google Images and you fill any gap free of charge. So it's simple to make and it costs absolutely nothing other than the bags. Box or bag three, wider geographical locations. And by that I mean a beachscape, a cityscape, but something more than an individual building. Bag four is going to make no sense yet. Bear with me till I model it. Just for now, could you scribble down blank sheets of paper? Blank sheets of paper. Turn the page, please. What goes wrong? Remember language deliberately simple, not simplistic. Edward de Bono wrote an entire book about the difference. What goes wrong? <coughs> Natural disasters. Cheers the kids up no end. And then I'm there that my Leonard Cohen albums, which usually divides an audience into those over 40 who are humming Suzanne takes it down to a place near the river, and those under 40 who have no idea what I'm on about. I tried a Leonard Cohen gag at an MQT conference about five years ago. It was met with a sea of faces who clearly had no idea what I was on about. So I tried to redeem myself. I said he's like Morrissey, but from the 1960s. No one laughed at that either. You know when you reach a stage in life where you have to admit you haven't actually just left university. I think the technical term for me is denial. Flood, fire, storm, weather pornography. The Sunday supplements are packed full of it. You'll find masses of examples. Box or bag six, any people, anyone can help someone else, so don't focus on the services. Box seven needs a caveat added to it, and it's not a joke. It's any location other than graveyards. You'll see when I model it in a minute. Graveyards made for a somewhat cheerless end to a lesson I was observing with a year two class. And uh, other than graveyards, I've had no bother with any other location, but I wouldn't stick a graveyard in there. You'll see why in a short while. Finally, the last bag feelings, people <coughs> looking happy or sad. So, 
I have eight bags in a line. Who, where, where next, why, what goes wrong, who else, where last feelings on the front of them. I'm using it as soon as possible. Nursery reception is where it starts. The aim being to weed them off it when they've got it. Less and less of the older kids need it year on year. And then I can move into genres and more complex non-linear structural models. Turn back a page to structured oracy. I'm going to do it as I teach it. This is where it will end up. So I'm not being condescending. Today we're going to make a story that's never been made before. I wonder who's going to take a picture of who by. Thank you for volunteering, telling me. There's only one in, don't get overly excited. Now, not so long ago, can I pinch that? There was a boy called, would you like to give him a name? It's a boy called Robert. Did Robert have short hair or long hair? Did Robert seem happy or was he really sad? So let's stick Robert above the who bag. Could you make a note with the youngest children close observation questions? Was he tall, short, wide, thin, happy, sad? I hope you don't agree with the youngest pupils. That's appropriate language. You know the biggest issue is as you move up through a school in terms of characterisation that it remains predominantly visible with older children. Uh, in old terms, pre-level two, he had white hair, a black top and grey trousers. I wouldn't be too distressed by. Do you know what I would be distressed by though? Back to old levels so you understand what I'm talking about in those terms. If at level five kids were writing something like he had white thinning patchy hair, a black tattered top and frayed grey trousers, that's poor characterisation. Because if they could write that, they could easily write beyond a visual description. Later this morning, I'll show you strategies to weed them off it. But self-audit in your own classes. I guarantee you, even some of the most able children, when you unpick characterisation, it's predominantly visual. And they need strategies to weed them off that error. With the youngest children, it's appropriate. Could you also make a note, actions from the start? It's not a gimmick. I'm using actions from the start because it creates a different neural pathway for the language to just say this. So not so long ago there was a boy called, was he Robert today? Was a, I forget who he is all the time, my memory's adult. Not so long ago there was a boy called Robert. The kids would join in, you don't have to, we weren't going to. He had short dark hair and he felt really happy. But do you know what? We don't know where Robert lived. I wonder who'd like to take a picture from the where bag. Thank you for volunteering. Now, thank you. Could you make a note from nursery reception onward, multi sensory questions for the wear bag? I wonder what Robert could see out of the window. I wonder what he could hear. Possibly what could he smell but know the cohort well from bitter experience. And then how did he feel? Why am I doing that? If I was auditing your skill, auditing, not training you, I'd walk into nursery and reception. And I'd say to the nursery and reception staff, in, that's the staff, not the pupils, in your whole school approach to narrative writing, what's the key thing you're looking for as soon as possible in this school in relationship to setting? And if staff could say as soon as possible, we want pupils to be able to describe what they can see, hear, smell and how they feel, I think we're cooking. I'd then walk into year six and I'd say to the pupils, you can do it tomorrow, you don't need me in your school to check it. And I'd say to the pupils, when you write about a place, what's the most important thing you should remember? And if the pupils could say, see, hear, smell, feeling, we're laughing. If we sing from the same song sheet, there's a correlation between early oral expectation and later written outcome. I don't expect nursery to be doing multi sensory locational writing, but I expect every member of staff in a school to be able to articulate the key targets we're aiming for. All school approaches drive up standards. Does that make sense, folks? That's the key point, and that's the bit I'd check. If you look at Oscar Wilde's picture of Dorian Gray, do you know what the first paragraph of that book is? A multi-sensory appeal to readers. If you want to pick J.K. Rowling, when there's a setting, you look at how it's a multi-sensory appeal to a reader. There's a long literary tradition of doing it. In some of the most underprivileged wards in this country, I can walk into a year two class and say to the pupils, when you write about a place, what should we remember? And the kids can say, see, hear, smell, feeling. If they can do that in year two, guess what I can do in key stage two? I can work on a more nuanced approach. 
to locational writing. That's my start point. Not so long ago, a boy called Joseph, short dark hair, felt really happy. Joseph lived in a house with a big lawn in front of it. He could hear the birds singing in the trees and the cars going beep, beep, beep down the road at the bottom of the garden. One day, though, Joseph set off on a trip. I wonder where he went next. Could you make a note in your pack? This creates dynamic momentum. This drives the story forward. So where next? One of the pupils comes to the front and holds a picture out. For those at the back, it's a city. Could you make one word stand out in your notes, the word through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H? I say, I wonder where Joseph was going through on his trip. The reason that word is essential is he's going to wherever comes out of the where last bag. He's going through that location en route. So precise oracy, fundamentally important. And then could you make another note, ditto, same questions as last bag. It's another bite at the cherry. It's another location. What could he see, hear, smell, feel it? Joseph set off on a trip through a city. He could see the tall skyscrapers. He could hear the buses roaring down the road. With every footfall, he felt more and more scared. But you know what? We don't know why Joseph's gone on that trip. I wonder who'd like to take the picture out for the wide bag. And they pull out. There is. I guarantee you. And they pull out a blank sheet of paper. Now, in drama terms, if you wish to note, this is called the mantle of the fool. Lots of people talk about the mantle of the expert that's incredibly useful. Equally useful on a daily basis is the mantle of the fool. That's where we deliberately make a mistake. So the pupils pull out a blank sheet of paper and I say, oh dear, Mr. Pete's forgot to put a picture in. I ask them two questions. 16 years at least once a fortnight I've talked with a class I've never met before, these two questions have never failed. Was he going to see someone? Possibly get with your partner, depends on the makeup of the school I'm teaching in. Was he going to see someone? Sees the operative word. Or was he going to do something? See and do. Now, I'm not joking. In 16 years, the two most prevalent answers from children up to about the age of seven, eight, to those questions are gran, grandma or nana, to the first one, depending where I am in the country, or the shops to the second one, unless it's a posh area, in which case park takes over. But I get a lot more shops than parks. So let's say I get one of the usual answers. He was going to see his gran. Now this might be a small point in some of your schools, but it is worth discussing. And the key stage one, two issues in handwriting in many schools. Ascenders and descenders not clearly demarcated, and upper and lower case mixed within words. In the schools where ascenders and descenders aren't clearly demarcated, I'm seeing a pattern. And do you know what the pattern is? People using interactive whiteboards without the templates turned on, no lines. Flip chart pads without lines on them, or roll along whiteboards without lines on them. How the heck can you model an ascender or a descender without a line? The terminology becomes redundant. Why are they called ascenders and descenders? Because they ascend from a line or they descend from a line. Now, sometimes people take away what they want you to have said on a training event, not what you actually have said. This is one of those instances. So let's be clear. One, what I'm not saying is children need lines. Children need a whole host of things to write on. Two, what I am saying, I hope forcibly, is if you're modelling writing in front of children, and that be in front of children who couldn't write a single letter, never mind a single word, very low baseline, there would always be a line. Why? If you look this way. If there's a line I can do this, I can say, oh, who's going to see his grand? Let's write it down so we don't forget it. Oh, I'm doing it good. I better remember to go under the line. If I've got a line, I have a talk out loud opportunity and children learn implicitly as well as explicitly. Might be a small point, but it may be one that's an issue in your school that's worth discussing. He was going to see his grand, and at first everything was fine, but then I wonder what was wrong. Don't take me on trust here. It's an unwise idea with anyone doing my job. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you, that's the point where stories fall apart for many children. And do you know what happens? 
They become lists of actions. And then Joseph went to the park. And then Joseph had his dinner. And then Joseph played football. And if you're particularly unlucky, and then Joseph went home and had his tea. And it was all a dream. The end. Now, why does that happen? Because the kid's savvy enough to know the teacher expectation to keep writing. But if they don't know how a story works, you know what a story reduces down to? A list of the actions, possibly with a whole range of adjectives thrown in as well. That's not a story. What this does, the stumbling block for many children, problem resolution. It's where lots of stories stall for younger kids. So I wonder what goes wrong. They come to the front and they pull out a picture. In this instance, a stall. Could you make a note, vary the format. If you've got the kids already doing this story, your shufflers will have begun to shuffle by that stage. So what I deliberately do is I vary the format. So far the format has been the teacher asks questions, the pupils respond. In the infants, typically, I do something dramatic. So I'd say, oh, there was a storm. Everyone stand up. And then I'd do something like, it's raining, it's raining, so what could I do? I could put on my boots and my new raincoat too. Let's button it up and count the buttons together. Clearly that would be asking for a ticket in year six. <laughs> can, we have, can we have the decent supply team, not the overweight Johnny Rogue who wears black to drive the skies that he's overweight? Um, you vary the format. With an older group of children, I might say, oh, there was a storm. I'm going to write storm in the middle of a circle and draw one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Don't forget year four, I've banned one word answers. That's important. If you're a very able year six group and you don't ban word and one word answers, you'll get windy, thunder and lightning. I'm hoping that they'll phrase back it. By banning one word answers, I'm more likely to achieve that end outcome. I then integrate the language. The sky got darker and darker, thunder rumbled, lightning flashed, and Joseph shouted, help, help, help. And I wonder who helped. One of the children comes to the front and from the who helps bags, pulls a picture. Now, today, I've got one picture in each bag. Do you know why? Because some of you don't know me from Adam. And when you're in a pressure situation, I always limit the variables. It's sound advice. If Ofsted were in your school and you're being observed, there are enough variables with 30-odd kids without adding another variable that's unnecessary to the equation. So if you're being observed, one picture per bag. If you're not being observed, 50 or 60 pictures per bag, if you follow the headings that I took you through earlier, if you remember people only places they could live. So, in this instance I've skewed it, there's one picture. So it's, a, a, it's a, an ambulance and a lifeboat. And what you do is you use questioning to model problem resolution. How do you think Joseph was helped? Easy in this instance. They pulled him into the lifeboat, they took him to the ambulance. If there's 60 pictures, it's not always that easy. So hypothetically, if they pulled out, let's say, just a picture of another child, I would need to use teacher questioning to model problem resolution. And I'd say something like, you think they stayed at the bottom of the hill as the water was getting higher and higher and higher? Or do you think they helped each other to climb up the hill? As long as the end result is problem resolution, you've dealt with one of the stumbling points in a story for many, many children. So in this instance, they pulled him into the boat, and I wonder where he got to last. Now I'll slow this bit down, because this is very important. Could you make a note, before asking one of the children to take a picture out of that bag, always go back to the middle. Always return to the middle of the story in class. I'll explain why and how. In class, here's what I would say. I said, before we take a picture out of the wear last bag, who was he going to see? His gran. So let's see if he got to his gran's house. Do you know why I'm doing that? Primacy, recency. If I don't, I'll get an ending which bears almost no relationship to the rest of the story from huge swathes of children. And what I'm actually looking for is middle end logically related um, in old level four terms. So I wonder where he got to last. By the way, can you now see why graveyards are such a bad idea in this bag? You know, Joseph's trip to his lifeless grandma's corpse is a bit of a career stopper, isn't it? And now let's watch the DVD of Karen children. I'm fast-tracking to competency procedures. So I said, let's see where he got to last. Now I've deliberately 
gone for a, a non-obvious one. Instead of pulling out his grand's house, this time I pulled out a picture of a hospital. Now, there are two options. You've just reminded him of his grand's house. If what you pull out could be his grand's house, could you make a note? You begin with the at last sentence stem. At last, where did he get to? Because of the recent reminder, you're going to get his grand's house. Middle end logically related. If it clearly isn't his grand's house, and this clearly isn't, you don't have a failed story. Instead of the at last sentence stem, you use an or dear sentence stem, and you reference the dilemma. Or dear, the story was so bad, he didn't end up in his grand's, where did he end up instead? And again, in that instance, the graveyard would suggest he died en route. So neither of those graveyards ain't a good idea. So in this one, finally, he was taken to the hospital, and I wonder how he felt. Again, I've gone for a non-obvious one. If they pulled out a picture of an unhappy person, that would be easier to make it fit, wouldn't it? Because you'd say he was really sad because he didn't get to see he was really sad because he didn't get to see his grand. But he looks chirpy here. Now there's one or two possibilities. He either didn't like his grand very much, <laughs> or, or which is let's pretend that's not the case, because that'd be quite sad. Or um, you could say to them, Well, I wonder why he felt happy. All his parents came to see him in the hospital, and even though he didn't get to see his grand, he felt happy. Now it isn't Jane Austen, but it's a damn sight more useful than beginning, middle, end. And in many of the most underprivileged wards in this country, if this is being used by children in nursery as appropriate, reception year one and year two, four years into the project, by year two, many children in their heads have got who, where, where next, why, what goes wrong, who else, where last time. Thanks.